We've been fighting that dump down the road for as long as I can remember, perhaps as far back as the 70s. And when the fire lights up, the smell is absolutely horrific. And what about the wind turbines that they're talking about? They say they're going to consult with us, the community, but I hear they've purchased the land already. What does that say? Actually, those aren't the words of the woman who just spoke them, but they are true and were said by African Nova Scotians and First Nations people who are living with toxic waste sites, wind farms, and pulp mills in their backyard. We've been marginalized so many times that we've begun to believe it. Almost. But there are a lot of injustices being done in regards to our community. And nobody cares. They don't care. Hey, that land was all a toxic dump, more or less. It, it's kind of scary to think about. I'd like to see some testing done on the soils um, to see exactly how contaminated it is. It affects all of us. You know, there are movements to save sharks. There are movements to save the whales. Well, those movements are all going to be in vain unless we save the ocean. If it's not okay for those toxins to be in my backyard... It's not okay in anyone's. The phenomenon of dumping toxic waste sites into the backyards of communities that do not have a strong voice actually has a name, environmental racism. The practice has been locating uh, uh, industrial waste sites uh, next to African Nova Scotia communities, native communities, and poor white communities. Communities that don't have an economic base to fight back. And you ask the question, is it environmental racism? It's environmental racism, racism to the core. It was 1784, and we had just been in a war for freedom from slavery. Yeah, yeah. But we still want to be fighting. Still, we will last in line for all the promises. Yeah. Uh, this fight has been going on uh, really since the, the mid-70s. And as we look back, like, and you look over the years, like the politicians, they were standing up when they're on the opposite side. And then when they get the chair, you know, into the provincial government, then the people that they thought before that was going to stand up for them and do the fight for them, more or less let them down. Power transformers leaking PCBs went into the site. Uh, dead animals went into the site. Uh, anything and everything went into the site, as I said, because no checks and balance. Right. Bunkersy oil waste uh, to the tune of 15,000 industrial bags went into the landfill site without the community's knowledge uh, and had no say whether it should go there or it shouldn't go there. We were at a meeting in December, I think it was 2010, and they said the first generation landfill was leaking. And to me, if, the, if it was leaking over the years, it had to go down into the water table. And if it was going down into the water table, then it has to have some effect. The people who was uh, in, in Sackville was compensated into a five mile radius. We're less than five miles. The nearest com uh, community resident is less than a kilometer from their, from their, from their first generation landfill site. If they felt it was a threat into uh, Sackville, isn't it also a threat in our, in, in our community? Uh, a slew of people have, have passed away, you know, before they reached the age of 70. And, and so, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, the younger people feel that it's, it's uh, something to do with the landfill and some of the chemicals that they're dumping over there. And uh, as a result, uh, they, they don't really have any interest to, to live there or to bring their, you know, raise their children there. Uh, people are dying from rare cancers. My husband died of cancer, lung cancer and bowel cancer. My husband don't, never smoked a cigarette in his life. And sometimes I, I, I felt they're uh, defeated and frustrated. But I have a love for my community and my people, and they're, uh, I know that what's being done here uh, concerning the first and second generation landfill site is an injustice to my community. Well, it isn't fair. Like, you know, I'm a taxpayer. I've worked all my life. I've been working since I was around 16 years old. We want compensation. 
we want part of that six million dollar revenue that's generated every year to go into the our economic development pot to enhance and develop our community. We want better checks and balance in place to make sure that site, if we got to live alongside of it, it's not a threat to our health. I retired because of my back, and here I am. The system is, I'll say it screwed me over again. And here I am, my husband was died, or they killed my husband with the water. He gave him cancer. I'm living by myself now with a bad back. And eventually, yes, I'll have to leave my own home because I can't carry water, and I have no one to carry the water for me. So, yeah, I feel like I am ripped off by the federal government, the provincial government, and the municipal government. And nobody cares. They don't care. That land was all a toxic dump, more or less. Um, there's been quite a few cancer cases on the reserve. Um, a lot of people with asthma, um, allergy, uh, black mold growing in the houses, the swamps, the, you know, because of the swampy conditions, we were built on a swamp as well, so it's just a matter of landfill covered up. You can only cover up things for so long, and then the health effects are going to be, they're still going to be there. The airport is uh, directly right across from our reserve. The fumes from from their fuel are right above us. Like the planes are constantly going right over the reserve. The air pollution, you know, the sound, all of the houses shattering, shaking when they're going by. When you had the big rains and the floods in the spring coming from the airport, and all that water would all that whatever was on the airport come right down through the chemicals and that and. It had to go into the spring water. Down at the end of the road, it, it was called the flying school. They had on top the building the flying school. That's where they sold their car parts. That's where they ran their business out of there. It was, and it was there for years. And then when the band brought the land, they kept the buildings. We got the swamp. And I often question, why did we buy something that was toxic in the first place. Why did we buy a swamp? And I was always told what us or Indian Affairs wanted us to buy the land. I mean, it's been a concern for a long time about it, but unless you can actually start getting some research done and some testing done, I'd like to see some testing done on the soils um, to see exactly how contaminated it is. It would be really, really good if they could focus on some of the environmental effects on First Nation preserves. Where we've been placed, and maybe try and find some other avenues of, of correcting some of the problems that we have. It is not only our responsibility, you know, as stewards, but all of our all of our responsibility to protect Mother Earth and what affects the environment, um, the water, and the land. It affects all of us, and this is one of you know these are things that are very very important to us and to I would I would say to all to all the, the uh, population. It seems like a tough problem, I guess. It, it's kind of scary to think about. When Peter Pickdy was talking about like the dump behind the fish shack and everything and how it was just like all swampy there and there was pollution, I was at, like, as a kid, I would always go back there and play in the mud and I never knew until now. So it's kind of scary to think that I was just plain in oil and everything. Acadia Band should be moved, in my opinion, because of the chemicals that are there. We have 5,200 acres up in the Lake George area. And there will be battles that may seem too wide. Well, victory oh, it all defeat. has to do with the fact that we have been terrorized by this relentless enemy called racism for forever. They still empty and dump down Winder's Road. And if you go down there, you need to go down there and see. Somebody, something, something has to be done. 
the community, we as a community, had to get together, even if we have to put cards there. But they're still dumping stuff down there. We're going to be another Afferville if we don't watch out. Also, your land shrinks, right, until you no longer have any land left. So they take it away. They don't take it away all at once. They take it away in the favor of business because they, that's what it's for. And they strip away little bit by little bit. So the land where the wind turbines are to be located is surrounding your land. So guess what? The, 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 really, you're the target. Yeah. And like Denise said, when they were going to come to East Lake, they were going in through Bryant Street, coming up through the back of the, of the area. They're coming through East Lake, so we're all affected. Yeah. And our communities right now, as far as I'm concerned, in my community, there's a lot of issues going on because most of our people in our community are dying with cancer. We have a lot of arsenic in our wells that we tell government about, but things are not happening. But we don't, like Denise said, if we don't speak up, we're going to be another Africa bill. So we need to come here today and talk about the issues that are affecting our communities, and we have to stand together as communities. Like the Anglican Church owned the property, but it's overlooking East Preston, it's overlooking North Preston. We, if there's any effect, detrimental effect, we are going to be the victim of it. There is a place in Halifax, another place that uh, they want to put the wind towers. And these people were fighting against the wind towers, and they lost. They lost. And this is with a white community, I believe it is. They lost. So if they lost, what are we going to do? And another question is, what guarantee the effect of the water and the wind turbine government has given us that our grandchildren and children will still have a community to call their home in the next 20 to 40 years. The Anglican Church owns that property and they have leased or given that land to the turbine group. So before that happens, you might want to get active before it happens rather than get active after it happens. All we need to do is stop waiting for a reaction and start becoming proactive. Yeah. We wait until after the problem has been pushed into our faith and we've seen it happening. We wait too long before we get active and doing something to change the whole situation. I don't know personally who you talk to to stop it. I just know, okay, well, when it's time, if we got to go stand up by the road with some bats or something, well, then they ain't coming in. <laughs> but that's not, that's, not, that's not how it goes. So, so what I'm saying is we need to, like, if it means today or we need a, another day, put a plan together to not allow this to happen and whatever other issues that we have problems with, we need to start working on stuff getting done. I wouldn't expect Miss Norma or Aunt Vola or Aunt Vivian or like these guys to be doing that anymore because they, they fought the fight. If anything, they are elders now, so we are the next generation that needs to come up and actually push forward to do something. You find a good person, be black, red, yellow, or white. If they are a good person fighting on your behalf, you deal with that. But if you're gonna get people just being like carpetbaggers coming in to take advantage of you and go out the boat and leave you back here with nothing. Some of us will be sold into thinking that um, it's gonna save us some money. But like you said, they've already put in their five year strategic plan, Nova Scotia Power did. But I guess the question that we should all be thinking of as a community, as a community at large, is, you know, is that cell worth our health, our lives? Because no. no. There's no, there's no price we can put on our health, no. and there's, it just doesn't matter how much it is because once you're, you're, you're gone from the pollution, you can't bring it back. Nope. These things happen to us again and again and again, and there will be no victory over environmental racism unless we organize against it. In Cape Breton, there are some First Nations elders who believe that there is indeed another way, a better way, and it's time for everyone to listen to Mother Earth and to the people who have been listening to her for centuries. Well, it's, it's another old discussion on listening and learning. I also know that you need the white man's education to, uh, to uh, survive in this world and be happy.
and uh, and and I think the white man also needs me to what I uh, what I have to offer. You know, for instance, if I took a young boy or a young girl or a young youth into a stream and look at the water flow, and they would see the different plants and different things, and and the uh, the collaboration between the the elements and the creatures and human beings. For years, First Nations people have been observing, listening closely, warning that if Mother Earth is not respected, it will be to the detriment of everyone, all communities, everywhere. Our ears are poisoned, our rivers are poisoned, our forests are pretty much gone, and the animals are, are, are extinct even as we speak. With this two I scene, we very quickly realize and see that science, science is not going to save the environment or the natural world. But rather, rather uh, a change of a change of attitudes, change change of mindsets. We're just a uh, a speck. Um, we're just a speck compared to the the big mega cities, I call it, or the big towns or the big areas that they have. And uh, I don't think we have a my, my voice of no is not a good one. It's only one voice out of a 99, I call it. You know, it's very limited. Shortly after we moved to to what is now Eskatoni. Uh, my grandfather being a, a fur harvester, trapper, hunter, fisher, whatever, uh, he lived off the land quite uh, right from the get-go. So uh, <clears throat> I learned early from him, human beings have uh, entered into their uh, habitat or you know, the domestic uh, environment as uh, moved in and there's, they have no place to go. So I feel that uh, the responsibility of, uh, of people is to look after them. In a recent study by some American scientists, they discovered that students learn better when there were trees in view. Oncologists are just now discovering that we stand a better chance of surviving cancer if we are connected with nature. These are things that First Nations people have known for centuries, millennia. As it stands today, Mother Earth is not being cared for, and neither are her people. It's come to a point, as one elder noted, when you see a waste site or a pulp mill, you start looking around to see which reserve is located nearby. There are a lot of good politicians who open their eyes, but I guess uh, those good politicians nobody listens to. <laughs> Just listen to us and see our concerns, and and pretty well be equal and see, um, I, I wouldn't mind if they come to my reserve and try to live as a First Nation person and see how, uh, uh, how they would survive. Do you understand Micmac? But that's a language you ought to learn. <laughs> Not really. Once you start to learn my language, you understand the connection we have with Wikiju, Mother Earth. Environmental racism is something that we have to deal with each and every day because of our communities. We have 13 communities here in Nova Scotia. All of them are in places we did not choose to live at. But we still made the best of it. We used every single part of that environment where we lived in and never wasted one bit of it. But we are a pain. And we will remain a pain until they finally realize that you cannot go around disrespecting Mother Earth. They're poisoning Mother Earth so they can get a little bit of oil and natural gas. But to leave behind chemicals but you're killing people, killing children each and every day. Look at Pennsylvania. Look at it. Western Pennsylvania is going to be empty of people pretty soon because of the poison they put in the ground. I contend that African Canadians, African Nova Scotians, have been, the, have been impacted by environmental racism since our arrival here on the shores. Yes. Yes. 
1783 with the arrival of the Black Loyalists and then moving out of Birchtown, we, our communities were all located in degraded environments. It was all about environmental racism, what happened to my community of Africa. So, so I've, been, I've been involved in it for quite some time. But it's a new term, it's a new area of study. I, I uh, attended two prep comms leading up to the World Conference Against Racism. One was in Santiago de Chile, and the other one was in, in uh, Switzerland, Missouri. And one of the uh, very interesting things that became apparent to me was that environmental racism wasn't just perpetrated against Africa. Throughout this whole North, South, Central America, environmental racism has impacted all of the indigenous people and all of the people of African descent. Whether it be, you know, an issue in poverty, whether it be an issue in environmental racism, uh, people work in pockets and it's very important for us to come together as a community and work together. This, this is a community issue and it should be easy for people to get involved. This is to create safe, healthy communities. Go to every community. Go to the older people who knew the inside outs of their community. In Eskisoni we had three dumps, okay? And in one dump site, I believe, there was a lot of cancer. And that, I believe, cancer was caused by that dump that people built right over. I think uh, policy makers and decision makers need to get out in the community. They need to make their office hours available for the public and it's really important to listen to uh, different uh, parts of your community and understand that there are differences and those differences should be embraced and celebrated. Often what happens is that we're learning a perspective of the majority of, of the main culture and, and, and to me it's very important that we all work together to, to create healthy safe communities. I'd like, I'd like to see the politicians, okay, and the people that really matter to come to the communities and for us to let them realize that there is something going on, that we have some health hazards within our own communities. Our areas are not made for landfills because of the environmental issues, these things seep through the grounds, right? So we need to have, and people need to be educated on that. And I think a lot of times people are not educated on the environment and what it does. It's, it's our water, it's our air, it's everything. And when these things are allowed to go into, our, into the ground, it seeps into our, like somewhere along it's going to seep into the earth or it's going to come to the environment. It's going to affect all of us, whether it's a black community, white community, first nation community. I think the environment issue needs to be raised by all of us. During my research for my talk, I, um, I came across an uh, environmental justice model. And I think that uh, if we're going to move forward in terms of dealing with environmental racism, that the environmental justice model needs to be adapted by governments, by community groups, in terms of addressing the issue and impacts of environmental racism. There's a connection between the landfills and our peoples being killed. Between environmental damage and our physical, spiritual, and mental damage, whether from slavery, colonization, colored homes, or residential schools, and they think they can apologize and make it all better, just like they think they can recycle and make it all better. There's a relationship between continued pollution and their continued lack of solutions to racism and poverty because the problems lie at the root of settler society. It's a toxic legacy and it will never get better until we reject the mindset of exploitation by governments, businesses, industries, and corporations and return to African and indigenous ways of living and sustaining. Environmental racism, therefore, is a new manifestation of historic racial oppression. It's merely old wine in a new bottle. <laughs> That's what environment, I really, really like that. I really like that. Um, and I'm giving the stop sign there, but I, I do have to touch on the historical perspective of my community in terms of environmental racism. 
Uh, not only were we placed in an isolated situation, but before there was sewer in Halifax, the waste was collected from homes. A site was looked for. Many rejected because of health concerns. That waste site was placed right above Africville. In, uh, in our water supply, shallow wells, shallow ground, so you know what happened when it rained. Shit runs downhill. Um, so that was first. Second, in 1850, they built a railroad straight through the center of our community, displacing people in their homes. And at the time, of course, it was steam engines run by coal, and all of the smoke and hazardous of that was just spewed out throughout our community. Um, the second thing was in 1870, an infectious disease hospital was built above Africville. Now, you might say, oh, well, that was a hospital. The key to this is that they ran a sewer line from the hospital down through Africville, emptying at the high water mark. So when the tide went out, there was an open sewer <laughs> with no forms of protection for the children to keep them away from that, that site. Abattoirs, fertilizer plants, bone crushing mills, quarries, and last, not last, but second to last, in 1955, an open dump was put 300 meters from the nearest, nearest home in Africa. Oftentimes I feel like people don't speak up because they're afraid to offend someone. So uh, for me, I think why it's so controversial is because nobody wants to admit that they have actually harmed another human being. You are walking into a whole big, huge wall of bureaucracy. Be prepared, but hold your ground. Hold your ground. Do the right thing and tell them we will not put up with it anymore. You cannot come into our communities and ruin our land. Why? Because once you ruin our land, you'll ruin yours as well. It's, it's a subject matter that uh, crosses a lot of different areas. You know, not just poverty, but education, our health, uh, all of our well-being. So I'd like to see the researchers do a little bit of work in tying it all together as to why and, and how it impacts. Um, but at the same time, I think what we have to understand is that the Mi'kmaq community and our First Nations brothers and sisters have a structure of their own and that um, you can't uh, homogenize everything together into one, that we need to recognize the issues and their, their approach to their issues and that's very important that we do that. When we were placed here, when we came the, first, the second wave in 1783 and when we were dispersed to our isolated communities, it was the Mi'kmaq people who taught us how to live off the land. It was the Mi'kmaq people that taught us how to fish. It was the Mi'kmaq people that, that um, were very important to our, our survival in the wilderness because that's what it was, the wilderness. Environmental racism is something that I learned wasn't just something that was surrounded by my community in Shibanaki or in Nimbrook but it was something that people talked of from India, from Switzerland, from Holland, England. More often than not, it's, it's, its primary objective is to take care of this dominant society and put all of their garbage, literally all the garbage, onto people who cannot well afford to have garbage in their community. Natives, blacks, poor whites. These are the people who are directly affected by these global concerns. Not in my backyard. Well, it, I'm in your backyard. You cannot forget that. And while it's not, not in your backyard, it's in mine. And I have to live with the consequences of that. That's what environmental racism is. If it's not okay to have a toxic waste site in my backyard, 
Then it's not okay. Then it's not okay in my backyard. And it's not okay in my backyard. Or in my backyard. Or hers. Or his. Or hers. Or his. Or theirs.